Uh, Aileen, uh, yep. feel free to go ahead. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining me today for this uh, session and welcome. Uh, I'm Lynn Scholes and I've been working on the West Yorkshire Archive Service uh, project, the transcription project of the diaries and the travel journals for nearly two years. And I've got uh, sidetracked into many other and things and have a long list of things to do. But um, one thing that as the journals section of the project draws to a close, um, made me think about other and papers that could be of interest. She did keep a collection of other notebooks, um, such as her daily expenses, copies of business letters, uh, notes on estate management, but uh, a couple of notebooks that really stood out for me were her handwritten recipes and remedies. So remedies of um, health matters, household and, and self-care tips. So um, this is how I came up with buns, stomach, household and hair, uh, an introduction to some less well-known and lister notebooks. And all of these four topics are included um, as well as many other things in these uh, two notebooks of Anne's. So uh, before I go into a great deal of detail on the buns, one of the recipes, I'd like to sidetrack a little to Isabella Norcliffe and Langton Hall, where Anne spent uh, many a visit. And Isabella, as is well known, was one of Anne's earlier lovers. And she met, Anne met Isabella or Tib in about 1809. Um, Langton Hall was built in the 1730s and inherited by Tib's father in 1807. And there we have a picture of Tib, uh, which is extracted from a painting of the dining room at Langton Hall uh, from about 1832, which was painted by Tib's niece, uh, Mary Ellen Best. And uh, there will be a reason for all this discussion of uh, Tib and Langton Hall, etc. Uh, Tib was, um, Anne was very fond of Tib um, in the early years of their affairs and um, Anne wrote of Tib in 1810, I love the darling girl with all my heart. Tib was a lively outdoor full living sort of person. She was really into hunting and shooting. She drank quite a lot. Um, she was at times quite coarse and quite brazen. And uh, she had a, a snuff habit apparently. And the sort of person that she was, was captured by Anne in 1820. She prefers a rat, front, rat hunt at Langton to the most magnificent ball that can be given. So when I read this recipe of, that Anne had noted down of the buns, and you'll see why in a moment, I couldn't help thinking of Tib and the times at Langton Hall. The reason for the Langton Hall connection is uh, Anne wrote, to make buns, Mrs. Atkinson as made at Langton and much liked by A.L. And it's, it was this much liked by A.L. that really piqued my interest. Sidestepping again for just a moment, um, in the UK, in, even from the 16th century, there's been a long and uh, quite creative baking tradition and from those early uh, centuries there are many recipes for buns, donuts, biscuits, muffins and all those sweet sort of goods that we still enjoy today. Uh, picturing the scene a little at Shibden Hall uh, I believe there would have been an open fire in the kitchen, staff milling about and on baking day you might have had a kitchen maid beating batter all day long. We, Obviously, they had to do a lot of work by hand. Um, even the flour you had to put in the oven to, water, to dry it out before you could make use of it. Loaf sugar, and mentioned in this recipe, you've got a huge lump of sugar or uh, often 
uh, formed in a cone shape and you scraped off the amount of uh, sugar that you needed. Baking was done in a brick oven with a metal door and it took quite a lot of skill to know how hot the oven had become, how long to do your baking for and so on. Uh, so this recipe of Anne's, it, uh, it's a little bit flawed in places and uh, the one that really, the flaw that really stood out to me was where Anne writes to uh, roll the dough in a uh, load of the sugar, put it in the tin to bake. And in fact, if you did that, I'm pretty sure you get a pretty burnt uh, puddle of sugar at the bottom of your baking tin. So my baking skills are not great, but um, I did think I do need to adapt this recipe if I want to give it a go. And again, I was quite keen to do this because of Anne liking these buns. So here is the result. Um, the sultanas I added for a bit of texture, but the recipe which I sort of put together with the help of a baking book, I hasten to add, um, is on the right hand side there. They, they tasted pretty good and they gave me 11s every day. So um, give that a try if you, if you like eating that kind of thing. Moving on to um, the stomach, let's have a, I, I beg your pardon, I just want to talk about other recipes which are in these notebooks. So I focused on the buns because of my keen interest in them, but there are loads of recipes such as for marmalade, custards, French breads, um, and going back to Langton Hall, uh, a recipe from 1822 for a cheese souffle. Uh, souffles being particularly difficult to bake even today, that, that would be an interesting recipe, a challenging one to try. Uh, moving on to the stomach, quite logically, I think, from eating buns. A bit of background during the late 18th and early 19th century, the stomach was considered a very significant organ of the body and the root cause of a range of illnesses. Um, and it was believed that if you could fix the stomach, you could fix the illness. And although today we are well aware of the uh, importance of good gut health and good bacteria and so on. Uh, in the early 19th century, um, medics, as they were, felt that the stomach could, it was the cause of TB, uh, a, a heartbeat irregularity, poor eyesight, hypochondria, uh, mental disorder, loss of teeth, more or less everything. Um, so if you could fix the stomach, you could fix those things. In, the, in that period, there were doctors, as we know, but most people would not have been able to afford a doctor. So they would visit uh, a so-called quack uh, who had some medical knowledge and maybe used herbs and local knowledge. Um, and indeed, Anne herself visited a quack with um, Mariana Lawton. Uh, many people in the Regency period also relied on family handed down family recipes and formulas and furthermore Anne's bookshelves uh, contained a number of medical books as Anne was very interested in all things medical. So there's quite a lot of uh, these notes in these two notebooks of Anne's. Anne's uh, quite famously recorded her so-called motions in her diary many, many times in her journals, uh, usually at the start of a day's entry and quite often in uh, quite some detail. She writes in 1832, for instance, but I had a nice little notion on getting up for good and this put me in spirits. I think Anne had a good start to the day that day. Anne also mentions in her diaries and again in these journals uh, a range of gut problems of not only herself but her family aunt Anne 
and some of her friends, so uh, Mariana Lawton and Vera Hobart get a mention. Uh, some of the health treatments in the notebooks are for constipation, diarrhea, piles, and I couldn't help mentioning worms, which are not mentioned in these notebooks, but I will touch on those later on. The remedies include emetics, purgatives and laxatives. So for constipation, one of the remedies includes uh, exercise on horseback or any exercise today we would think would be a good thing. Friction on the abdomen, I think we would consider that today maybe a massage or even the injection of water which sounds a bit uh, extreme. For diarrhea, the uh, treatments have become a little severe. So in the notes from 1818, Anne mentions a concoction of calomel, opium and castor oil. Calium, calomel, I understand, is a mercury chloride. And in the 19th century, it was considered as something as a miracle drug. So it was used for syphilis, TB, cholera, cam cancer, even in grown toenails, it was noted for. Uh, but it was in fact a very harmful purgative. So if you had diarrhea, they were kind of treating you to have even more diarrhea. Um, and in fact, the calomel could cause um, gangrene mercury poisoning, deformity, loss of teeth, or even death. The uh, castor oil also causes great, uh, great diarrhea or in the wrong quantity to can. So the thinking in the early 19th century was that if you could purge the body of its contents, basically, or cause diarrhea, you were causing the body to get rid of whatever the problem was. Seems like a bit of a kill or cure to me. And Anne also has in the papers, there are a few loose papers with these notebooks. Uh, there are two prescriptions for piles of uh, Miss Fear Hobart in Hastings in 1832. One of which is Anne's own prescription. So the purgative and the emetic, um, Anne notes in 1823, a mild purgative frequently taken by M. Mariana. It has a range of ingredients, but they include chamomile, senna, salts, all to be taken in a wine glass full every morning at 11. That um, chamomile and senna in the right quantity seems a fairly gentle treatment. However, the emetic mentioned in the notebooks uh, includes uh, the ingredients antimony potassium tartrate. This antimony, antimony potassium tartrate today is used uh, apparently as an industrial chemical and pesticide. So the picture there, it's hardly surprising that people were caused to be very ill. Um, antimony was used from the Middle Ages in both humans and animals, and in large doses is a lethal poison. The uh, other remedies, health treatments mentioned in these notebooks include treatments for cancer, spasms, a lowness of spirits, TB, gonorrhea, and, and quite a range of other things, including imprudently drinking cold water. Um, that made their mind boggle a bit. I suppose then the cold water may have been very dirty. Moving on to household. To my mind, the household is not just the house, it's the whole estate or certainly the buildings and related matters. And we know that at Shipton Hall, there was a, a big barn where the carriages certainly these days are kept. Uh, 
Anne was very fond of her horses and she mentioned several over the years. Caradoc, Percy, the Black Mary and, and Hotspur is a big favorite in 1823. She paid Hotspur a huge amount of attention. She was always visiting him in the stables, bringing him his breakfast of um, oat cake. She loved watching him being dressed or got ready and watching him graze in the fields. She was fretting about the size and fit of his shoes and any injuries he might have. And she was keen to show him off to Miss Pickford. Now the horse and the carriage are relevant to this part of the session uh, because about a quarter of the remedies or the household remedies are all to do with horses and carriages. And I thought that reflected Anne's real interests. Um, from Mariana, she received a dye for the leather of carriages, very excellent, in 1822. From Mrs. Lawton at Lang Norcliffe, back at Langton, she received, um, uh, I think, 1826, uh, anti-attrition uh, recipe for greasing the wheels of carriages. And from the coachmaker in York in 1826, and I can just imagine Anne that. interrogating him, she got uh, a yeah. message for a method for blacking harnesses and other leather work on carriages. Of course, Anne had staff to do all of these things and inside the house as well, she uh, had a, a lot of jobs that needed doing, but she would have wanted them doing really well. Uh, a lot of the other recipes capture things like uh, removing rust from iron, making ink, which Anne, of course, would have been really interested in, how to gr uh, clean grease spots from paper, again, probably interesting to Anne, how to um, waterproof new boots and shoes, cleaning brass, cleaning marble and so on. So Anne would have had the staff busy on all of those things. <clears throat> Finally, to turning to hair, this uh, is a paint, uh, portrait of Anne, said to be from the period about 1806 to 1810. Uh, the reason I include it is that it's a similar period for where, as to when Anne wrote this first receipt, an old fashioned word for recipe, for shaving without soap, water or razor. And on the right hand side there, we have an image of the, this recipe um, and Anne's handwriting, which by the time she was writing daily journals changed quite a bit. So this was her writing at the age of just 13. So this was, this was on a single sheet of paper, this um, recipe for the hair removal. And then she notes it again in these notebooks as from an old paper in my own handwriting, dated Shibden Hall, May 1804. It will produce the complete effect of shaving without the assistance of soap, water or razor. This recipe had a load of ingredients, actually, including harmless things like uh, egg whites. And most of the ingredients seem to be fairly anodyne. Uh, lime water apparently causes hair to stiffen and bleach. Gum Arabic is uh, a hardened sort of tree sap and it, it glues and binds a paste, so I suppose it stays on. And um, roach alum is another of the ingredients and was used by barbers traditionally and maybe even still today uh, to calm shaving rash. So that 1804 recipe seemed uh, pretty harmless. Anne had another hair removal recipe from 1815. And again, going back to Langton uh, from a paper dated Langton 
February 1815. The famous Egyptian depilatory pomatum, a, a kind of pomade or um, scented hair oil or cream. This uh, ingredient, uh, sorry, the recipe was very short, but the ingredients seem very harsh. Uh, Rosma uh, is noted being a quicklime and sulfite of arsenic mixture. Uh, quicklime is very caustic and today is used in the production of plaster, cement and paints um, and ca can cause severe irritation when inhaled or placed on the skin or the eyes. The inhalation may cause coughing, sneezing and laboured breathing. Uh, if on the skin, it can burn or perforate the skin, uh, can cause abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. And arsenic, of course, is a well-known poison. Luckily, Anne's instructions were to leave this in place for just three minutes. She notes in these notebooks, this gray paste will, will make the hair fall off in three minutes without giving the smallest pain. Other, uh, there aren't so many uh, self-care tips in Anne's two notebooks, but uh, one of them is a, a cold cream recipe. So uh, for uh, making a cream for cooling and smoothing the skin. Anne famously came out with some real classics and um, the first one is, these are both noted in her journals. The first one here is from 1820. Burnett says her, Miss Valance's complaint is on her nerves. I know it is and I am the best doctor. She didn't have too much self doubt and she probably was actually one of the best doctors around or would have been. And going back to worms, um, which uh, Anne and Mariana visited the worm quack in, on Boxing Day, 1834. Anne uh, sometimes had an interesting line of chat. She asked the worm quack if she thought I had worms. No, uh, says the worm quack, not a likely subject. Whereupon Anne uh, decides to mention the one I parted with at Hastings. So in conclusion, I wanted to share these um, recipes from these two notebooks, and I'll give you a couple of references shortly. Um, there's much of interest, uh, recipes for meals, food, health treatments, household tips, and, and some self-care remedies. There's also a bundle of um, random prescriptions. So anyone with, um, interest or knowledge about pharmaceutical history uh, would find a lot of fun in those and also understand them, which I definitely didn't. I'd like to also um, refer you to other, another source of uh, these sorts of remedies, which is the Life Tracks Hacker on the Life Hacks Tracker even, the Life Hacks Tracker on the Pact with Potential website, which is um, a great source of, of all these kind of things. Just a bit of further reading and some background reading I did. Um, some of you, most of you will have read um, several of these books by the famous um, Choma Whitbread Liddington Trio. Uh, there's a huge amount of reading on the Pact with potential website more widely. These recipe books, I've mentioned here, the catalogue finding numbers at the West Yorkshire Archive Service for anyone who wants to pursue those. They're not digitized yet. And then uh, the baking, um, there was a woman on the Great British Bake Off called Mary Ann Burmans and a few years ago now, and she wrote a book called Great British Bakes. So if you're interested in both recipes and her background to those, uh, she produced a good book called Great British Bakes. And 
a, a fairly good book um, on the Regency period generally uh, and across all sort of strata of society is the Time Traveller's Guide to Regency Britain, which I've, I've listed there. So I hope that was a, an interesting trot through these notebooks, which I've um, spent some time on, loads more to do. And uh, if, you, if anyone has any questions, then please, um, I think there's a raise hands button or just raise your hand in the old fashioned way. If anybody wants to, oh, we've got one at the top there. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, we've got time for, for one question, go for it. I think that I think they've gone. Um, anybody else got any questions? Like to raise their hand? Um, I think that I think that might be it. Just double check in one last time. We are right at the end of this session, actually. But um, yeah, we have got the one. I think I see a hand raise. Uh, this I can't is, see it. I, oh, here. <laughs> Go ahead. OK, uh, this is Pat Nelson. And I wondered if there was anything that really stood out or startled you. You obviously have a background and in information on this area. Was there anything particularly that, you know, when you read it, you said, wow. Uh, yes, I mean, really, these very caustic, um, poisonous, toxic treatments for, I mean, for the hair removal, for one thing, which could burn your skin really badly if misused. Um, and some of, I, I didn't know much about, at, well, really nothing at all about healthcare treatments in those times and some of the purgatives and laxatives and emetics I when I read the recipe or remedies books um, to see the ingredients I had to look those up and they sounded pretty scary so yeah. those on the kind of quite frightening side um, looking at the recipes I thought oh wow they look great I really like to try to make some of those and it was a a lot of fun uh, making the buns are really easy um, and thinking about how much Anne liked them that's quite a nice little note of Anne's. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thanks for the question. Okay, thank you everybody. I'm sorry we are out of time but um, thanks Lynn for a really good presentation and um, grab a brew and we'll see you in the next session. Fabulous, thanks everybody. Bye.